Okay, welcome everyone and thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, we set up as a webinar this evening due to popular demand, so there's over 300 people registered, so we're just waiting for the last few to come in. Um, so that's why it might look a little bit different tonight, uh, but you'll all be able to see and hear Russell loud and clear. You can let me know otherwise through the chat function. Um, so thank you all for joining us for tonight's talk, which is Flora in the Irish Uplands. Our speaker tonight is Russell Mills, and you may know him as a training provider or possibly as a guide or even the owner of Mountain Trails. However, what you might know is his background education is in horticulture and botany, and he specialised in trees. He also had previously ran a commercial nursery for trees and also owned and ran his own garden centre. So he's fully equipped to guide us through the flora of the Irish uplands this evening. Um, if you do want to ask any questions throughout the evening, you can just send it through the Q&A box there um, and we will get to it by the end of the evening. So without further ado, I would like to hand it over to Russell. Welcome, Russ. How are you this evening? I'm very well, thank you, Ruth. How are you? Good, thank you. Looking Good forward stuff. to it. Yeah, hello, everybody. Okay, well, hopefully everybody's screen has changed and you can now see Flora of the Irish Uplands in a, a wee picture. Um, clearly, uh, I'm sure we're all aware from our activities hiking in the hills that uh, there's a, a great diversity of plant life in the uplands and Equally, I'm sure we're all aware that there is great change in what we can see between the uh, valleys and the mountain tops. The plant assemblages change as we go up the mountain. And to take account of that, we divide the mountains into what we call upland ecological zones or upland life zones. So we'd start in the valleys with what we call the lowland zone. And then we go, as we go up in heights, submontane zone, the montane zone and the high montane zone. And these upland zones are, um, determined by the weather conditions that are prevalent. So clearly the weather in the high montane zone is going to be more severe than, than in the valleys and in the lowland zone. And the factors that really affect what plants are likely to grow within each of these zones, or each of these ecological zones, um, are things like rainfall. So higher rainfall in the, in, in the mountains, lower temperatures, wind speed, and the sunlight or cloud cover. All of those have a factor. And the numbers you see, the meters, the height for each of those lowlands, each of those zones, is not really fixed. They kind of, they can move. Um, and particularly with increasing latitude. So, with increasing latitude, the boundaries of these zones will drop down the mountain. So those numbers will get smaller. So for example, the lowland zone, which says below 350 meters, would perhaps come down to 150 meters um, in, a, in a more northerly latitude. So the more north and west we go in Ireland and the UK, the lower these zone boundaries will be. And indeed, in some places, maybe up in Donegal or in Scotland, there'll be no lowland zone, zone at all. At, at, at the valley level, it would go, be, go straight into submontane conditions. And this determines what plants we're likely to find in each of these zones. So that's what we're going to do this evening. We're going to work our way through these from the valley and we're going to make our way up the mountain and have a look at what sort of plants we might find 
in each of these zones. So the first one I want to look at is the lowland zone. It's um, below 350 meters. And this is where you would find enclosed farmland and a degree of human management. So this would be uh, hill farms, upland pasture. Um, possibly with wildflower rich grasslands and broadleaf trees. So you're going to find oak and ash and birch trees. And here you're also going to find um, ancient woodlands, which can often contain slow growing and ecological diverse environments. And these are labeled as temperate rainforests in a very interesting environment. And in temperate rainforests, you get lichens, ferns, mosses, liverworts. These are the plants that predominate and they take a long time to develop and they're very rare habitats. And temperate rainforests or ancient rainforests in this zone, you're talking really about woodland that's over 400 years old. So they take a long time to develop. It doesn't happen very quickly. And the right sort of environments for this are found in um, Ireland, uh, in the northwest of the UK, that's the Scottish coastline, northwestern USA and Canada, Japan, Chile, and New Zealand, sort of places where there's relatively high rainfall and a temperate climate. And in Ireland, these are now quite rare um, and are found generally in gullies and in um, narrow ravines. But let's have a look what we can see in these areas. This is typically what enclosed grassland might look like. So the spiky plant there, and many of you will recognize that as soft rush. Uh, it's quite widespread throughout the sort of damp, mountainy grasslands. And we asked, we're up in the valleys here in the, between the mountains, so the rainfall is quite high. So it's quite likely the ground is going to be saturated. So we're seeing soft rush. And we're also seeing this, this cuckoo flower is quite a common plant that we might find in this zone. Um, it's the little white flower we saw interspersed there with the rush. And, and cuckoo flower or um, lady smock is a spring flowering plant, Herald Spring. It's a lovely wee plant that we can see in these meadows in the springtime. Quite easy to recognize, not too, uh, uh, and, and very common. So we can quite easily find this chap around our, our meadows. And around the meadow edges, you might find plants like this one, which is called greater stitchwort and um, gets its name because it's um, meant to uh, alleviate pains in the side or stitches, as we used to call them when I was a kid. So, um, yeah, stitchwort. So that's often seen in uh, hedgerow bottoms around the, around the edges of these, of these uh, rough pasture lands. Primrose, I'm sure if we're all familiar with primrose, but that's um, primroses are an indicator of uh, an undisturbed and quite um, ancient environment because they take a long time to establish. So when you've got a lot of primroses, you've got quite an, an old established, if it's a hedgerow or if it's a, a, a woodland. And they've been there a long time, along with bluebells as well. Bluebells are an indicator of fairly long established woodland. You might find this, this is uh, sheep scabious or sheep's bit scabious. Um, and this pale blue flower, it's a, it's a summer flowering, spring and summer flowering uh, scabious and it likes dry conditions. And so you'll find this growing on walls and on banks and maybe on the side of, of well-drained gravel tracks. Um, and it's not to be mistaken with with the devil's bit scabious, which looks similar, but it's more mauvey in color, flowers in the autumn, and is found on much damper ground. So the two are, the two are not found together, that's for sure. They, they like very different conditions.
And this is another one we might find. This is Ragged Robin. Um, Ragged Robin likes damp conditions, likes growing in, in fairly damp conditions. There's a lot of these plants that we found in the mountains for obvious reasons. Uh, this particular one was uh, taken in the sleeve blooms. So uh, in the sleeve bloom hills. <clears throat> and this is a typical look at the temperate rainforest. And what, what signifies them really is that the, there are a lot of, there's a lot of birch and oak. So these, these spindly trees here are, are all birch and the slightly thicker trunked trees is an oak. Um, and these, uh, the ground is typically carpeted with mosses um, and a few ferns. And these are very important habitats for invertebrates um, and for plants. And they take a very long time to establish. Very, very long time. Um, we might find ferns growing on trees like this polypody. So you've got mosses and polypody growing here on this big trunk of an oak tree. And they're what we call epiphytes. And an epiphyte is a plant that will use a tree or a wall or, or, or to, to grow on. So it uses a pl another plant um, for support, but doesn't extract any nutrients from that plant. So it's, it's entirely self-sufficient. It's just using it as a, a base for its roots. And this polypody fern is, is, is commonly found on oak trees. And um, if you're familiar with Glendalock um, near the uh, upper lake, the, the little gorge where the river runs down there and the um, information center there, you, the trees around that area, a lot of the oak trees there have these polypody ferns growing on their branches. And this is a sign of a very ancient woodland. Take, it takes a long time for these environments to develop. And they're very rare in Ireland, very rare indeed. Um, so it's um, no wonder that it's a protected environment. So next time you're out and about, there's also, I believe you can see there's a, there's, there's, there's down in the Beera Peninsula, there's, there's other areas down there in Cork, in West Cork, where you can find this kind of environment, Connemara and in Donegal as well. But they are, they're increasingly rare because of, um, you know, obviously the trees get cut down and the land gets improved. And so um, in the past, these areas have been destroyed. So they're very um, few and far between right now. So typically another fern we might find in the um, lowland zone is the broad buckler fern. And this uh, fern, unlike bracken, which it, it spreads through those black bootlace like rhizomes, the buckler ferns grow in clumps. And you may find them along uh, woodland tracks and rides, um, forest roads. And you may also quite often see them being, uh, they look like they've been grazed and they have been grazed because the deer will eat them. So the deer are the controlling factor with the broad buckler fern, they, they, they eat it um, and therefore keep it in check. Um, bracken <clears throat> that we're all very familiar with and ubiquitously covers the hillsides, that's, um, getting kind of out of control. And, and part of the reason for that is that there is, it doesn't get eaten by anything. It's quite toxic, so nothing eats it. But um, it was at one time controlled by cattle when more cattle were on the hill and the cattle would tread it down basically and break down the, the stems and uh, particularly in the uh, early part of the season when, it was, when they're young, they would break them off. Uh, but the sheep don't have the same weight to be able to break them in the same way. So the, uh, the bracken is growing unchecked. It 
This is another common fern you might see growing in this area in woodlands. It's called the hard fern. Um, it's quite um, recognizable when you see it. Again, growing around woodland edges and in this sort of lowland environment. And the heart's tongue fern as well. And the heart's tongue fern likes um, limey conditions, as, uh, alkaline conditions. So you'd file it, find it growing in, uh, in walls in the west, in the, in the east rather, in walls, um, where it, in the lime mortar, or um, particularly you find it's growing quite a lot over in the limestone, like in, in the burren, which is where you see a lot of this sort of plant over in the burren. And that's part of the country. There's a lot of mosses you'll find growing in these growing in this in these areas. Uh, so there's just a couple, just to uh, some of the more common ones we might see. The red-stemmed feather moss. This one, feather mosses are quite widespread. Um, uh, all mosses are what they call bryophytes, and um, bryophytes are um, very common. Mosses are very common in Ireland because of our climate, and it's one of the best places in the world for studying them. So people come from all over the world to study bryophytes in Ireland. Um, but this is one of the more common ones, the feather moss, several species. This is the red stemmed one. And what I'm sure you're familiar with is the star moss. And this one we see growing in clumps all, all around the edges of woodlands. And whether it's uh, plantation or whether it's natural woodland, we'll see this this moss growing in, in sort of cushions, large sort of cushiony clumps can grow up to up to uh, 30 centimeters or more in height um, and is uh, the tallest growing moss in Ireland. So if we move on up, we're going up the mountainside a bit. So we're leaving the valley and we're going up into the lower hills and um, the heights for, for this, for the submontane zone here, 350 to 650 meters, that's a generally for the sort of middle to southern part of Ireland. So that would be, that would be for sort of Wicklow Mountains, uh, Galtees, Comoras, going south. Um, if you were going up north into Donegal, and, 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 uh, then this zone would be lower may well may well even be at sea level in some places and the submontane zone is typified by hill grassland uh, dry and wet heathland scrub trees and shrubs and in dry heath dry heath would be what you are quite familiar with walking in the irish hills so a lot of heather bilberry grasses and sedges. So that's the kind of, the, the, this is the kind of environment that you would be, see a lot of walking in the hills um, of Ireland. And that grades into what we call wet heath. So in the wetter spots, and in wet heath we'd find plants like bog asphodel, sundew, butterwort, bog pimple and cotton grasses. And very often wet heath is it's sort of interspersed with and grades into blanket bog. So it's kind of there's a there's there's, there's a gradation between these these different environments within the submontane zone. And we may also find some scraggy trees growing. There's not a lot of lot of trees growing um, in our hills. Uh, that's mainly that's because of grazing pressure, overgrazing mainly by sheep. Um, and so the trees don't get a chance to grow. But um, oh, it's jumped, sorry. Doing its own thing here. Go back, apologies. Um, so the trees don't get a chance to grow, though in some places, some parts in the Wicklow Mountains and elsewhere where they fence the deer out and the sheep out, then um, regeneration of trees happens in these areas. 
what they call pioneer species come in. That's typically birch and alder to start with. And they come in and um, start to grow alongside plants like rowan. So we might find scrubby trees in, the, in, in these areas, but where we do, it's often where the grazing is, is not possible because of the terrain. It's very steep terrain, so there's a little grazing being done there, or they're on ledges, and that's another name for it. It's called ledge veg. It's places where the grazing animals can't get to and you get this more luxuriant um, growth. And you might see willow or bog myrtle or rowan and possibly juniper in these areas. So the question there from Joshua, she just wanted to ask a question there. Um, yeah. Just ask her to unmute there. This thing's very temperamental. What's the question? No, sorry, Russ, she wanted to ask a question just verbally, so she, she just needs to unmute there. Uh, yeah, oh God. Go on then. No, no, it's a mistake, sorry, sorry. Okay, it's sorry. Sorry. Okay, She's no problem. jumping all over the place, this thing at the moment, so apologies for that. So the heathers, the heathers that we might find, typically, these are the three main heathers that we have in, um, in this zone. And so on the left-hand side, we have ling. Ling is uh, the sort of ubiquitous head that we see all across the Irish mountains and hillsides. It's the one that all the folk songs are sung about. Um, and it's this lovely purple, mauvey purple color. And it flowers late summer um, and or summer into autumn and uh, forms big clumps. And this, can, this is often found and interspersed with the one in the bottom right, which is bell heather. And bell heather forms uh, rounded mounds of foliage, very much like the ling. It's very difficult to tell apart until it flowers. And the, the bell heather flowers from sort of spring, May, May through to uh, September. So it, it flowers a much longer period during the year. And the bell heather particularly likes drier ground. So you'll find the bell heather in the drier heath rather than the wet heath. Um, and the bell heather tends to be replaced by the plant in the top right, which is um, cross leaved heath. And cross leaved heath is a straggly, oh no, it's a straggly um, plant with. Um, doesn't really form a bush form at all. It's um, loose stems, uh, a turquoise blue colored stems with uh, pale pink bell-like flowers on the top. And this cross-leaved heath um, favors wetter ground. So when we get to wet heath, we'll find ling and cross-leaved heath. On the drier ground, we'll find ling and bell heather. And if the ground gets really particularly wet, and we're getting very close to blanket bog conditions, then we don't get any ling, that heather can't survive, but we will still find the cross-leaved heath growing in those conditions. And the, the, the cross-leaved heath also flowers over a long period um, from uh, early, early summer right through to the autumn. Um, so, there is one time of the year when all three flower together, and that is late July, early August. And that is the time to get out and have a look for these because you'll be able to identify all three by their flowers and be able to distinguish between them. So that is the best time to go heather hunting, late July, early August, to be able to tell them apart. Now this picture, which has been uh, rudely trying to take over my screen for the last 10 minutes, is bilberry, which you'll be very familiar with. And bilberries are a cousin of the blueberries that you buy in the supermarkets. They're smaller uh, and their vitamins uh, 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 con content is much more concentrated. So they're excellent food 
And the bilberry will be as a dry heath, so you'll see a lot on dry heath. Um, it has little pale pink bell-like flowers in the spring. And then at the height of summer, you get these lovely uh, blue fruits, quite small, the fruits, only a couple of millimeters across, but it's, they're very delicious and I would recommend you try them if you haven't already done so. One of the interesting things about bilberry is it's a deciduous plant. It loses its leaves in the autumn, in the winter, but the stems are green so that it still photosynthesizes over the winter. So that means it's still um, producing energy, producing sugars for itself. So it's a kind of coping mechanism with its harsh conditions and it continues to photosynthesize over the winter. Unlike trees like rowans and oaks and birch, which when their leaves drop, they go completely dormant. This is a lovely wee plant. I'm sure some of you be familiar with this milkwort. Um, it's most often found in this blue form. It's quite a small plant. You find it in small little straggly clumps um, in the hills. Can be a mauvey pink as well, um, but most commonly it's this blue form. Name called milkwort because it was believed that um, if you fed it to cattle, it would improve their milk yield. So it was believed by the ancient farmers of long ago that it had these properties, hence, hence its name milkwort. Usually any plant with wart on the end has some, some property useful to man, or, or a believed property anyway, because they're not all proven by any means. This one certainly wasn't. So that was the, that was the uh, belief anyway. And, and, and I'm sure many of you have seen these lovely little blue jewels of flowers dotted around the hillside. <clears throat> and another really common one we see is this chap, this Tormentil. Again, I'm sure you've seen these little yellow flowers. They're only like about five millimeters across. And, uh, uh, and it's a member of the uh, Potentilla family. And Potentilla is uh, also called um, Sank foils and sank foil means five petals in French. Uh, and this one only has four. It is the only member of the Potentilla family to have just four petals. Um, and it's one of the smaller ones. And it sort of straggles its way, grows its way through the, the undergrowth, a very low vegetation in the hills uh, and flowers right through the season in this in this submontane zone but we won't see it higher up it disappears when we get a little bit higher it's not able to survive as it gets slightly wetter we'll see this chap lousewort lousewort is is generally um this sort of mauvey purple color grows about 10 centimeters high. Uh, sometimes it's white. There's a bit of a white patch there on the right hand picture. Um, and lousewort is semi-parasitic. So it's, it's feeding, to some extent, it's feeding off the roots of other plants. It's tapping into their food supply and stealing their food. And again, this flowers in the summer, so you see it right through the summer, but we're getting, it's getting slightly wetter now. We're moving in more towards wet heath, so you won't find this one on dry heath too much. You certainly won't find this chap on dry heath, and you, it's a very indicative plant of, of, of wetter ground, and this is bog asphodel. And this flowers in the um, mid to late summer. These beautiful yellow flowers. And these are quite tall plants. These, I mean, this is a low shot, but these plants are probably about 20 centimeters high, but it's often only grows to half that. Um, and you'll find it growing in sort of damp patches and um, flushes uh, where, where there's drainage, where there's a drainage line where water is running off the hill. You find this bog asphodel, a lovely plant of the late summer.
And you also find this little chap in wet ground as well, um, bog pimpernel, much more common than you might think. Um, its leaves are these chains of small round leaves that sort of um, straggle through the undergrowth. And then you've got these really delicate little white flowers, or well, pink flowers really, sorry, rather than white. Um, and there again, they're only a couple of millimeters across, so they're quite small. And we'd be often walking through, walking along through the, the damper parts of the hills, trying to keep our feet dry. And we'll miss these wee things. We just stomp on them without really realizing. That's sitting in a load of sedge, like greenery around that is sedge. <clears throat> Then this is one I'm sure you're familiar with. This is butterwort. Butterwort is one of the three insect eating carnivorous plants that we have in Ireland. Two are land-based, one is water-based. And this chap, um, these yellow fleshy leaves have uh, wee hairs on the leaves, which exude a sweet sticky substance, which attracts the insects. And the insects come in to feed on this sticky syrup and get trapped. They get stuck to it. They can't escape. The, um, the glue that um, is on these fine hairs on the inside of the leaves here is one of the strongest glues known in nature. And they just can't escape. And then the plant exudes enzymes and then dissolves the insect and that's how it supplements its diet. Um, so that's how it survives in these harsh conditions. And you'll find it in, in, in sunnier spots. Uh, it doesn't really like it too cold, so it will be in sheltered sunny spots, um, sometimes found on a sort of bank of culverts or, um, or in, in, in flushes, mountain flushes. And in the summer, it has this lovely blue flower on a single stalk comes out of the middle. So it's very distinctive plant in the summer. In this instance, the greenery around this, this, uh, this, this butterwort is um, bog asphodel. So um, there's bog asphodel leaves, which are kind of look a bit like irises. Uh, the miniature iris leaves almost, what they look like. Someone just made a comment there, children love the butterwort, especially when you open up the curled buttery leaves to reveal the insects. Yeah, the leaves in butterwort don't, they don't kind of curl up like uh, so much as, as, as other, like the sundew here does. Um, but yeah, um, it's fascinating plant. And there's the, uh, another um, carnivorous plant we have is the sundews. And there's three, um, three species of sundew in Ireland. There's the, um, the, the round leaf sundew, which you might be familiar with, grows to, to about 15 centimeters high, is very common. And again, grows in wet, in wet ground. Then there's the oblong, oblong leaf sundew, which is a lot less common. And then there is a great sundew, which is confined to parts of the west of Ireland. And it's quite, it grows to about 20 centimeters high um, and it's quite a substantial plant. And this is, I was just checking it this, eve, this afternoon before I, I did this. And this is actually mislabeled. This is great sundew. It's not oblong leaf sundew. Uh, so apologies there. But um, you can see the sort of spatula like leaves on this plant rather than the, the very round leaves of, of the round leaf sundew. And this plant uh, has a, again, a single flower stalk with white flowers rather than blue that appear on the top, um, again in the summer. And you can see on this plant quite clearly, you can see the sort of the, 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 the red hairs around the side of the leaf. And on the end of each of the hairs, there's a little drop of dew. Um, and again, 
the insects are attracted to this dew, this, this um, sugary substance, hence the, hence the name. And um, then when the insect lands on the plant, it can't escape. And in this case, the leaf gradually curls up around the insect, it rolls up around the insect and, um, and again, it releases enzymes and then digests the insect in its own time. So again, supplementing its diet. The main plants, the other greenery surrounding this particular plant looks like deer grass to me, deer grass and bog asphodel. And this was shot in Connemara, this picture was taken in Connemara. Oh, it's rushing on, isn't it? As we, uh, as we go into um, wetter conditions, we get to blanket bog. And blanket bog is a really important environment. Um, it's becoming uh, increasingly important in our times because of its carbon sequestering properties. In other words, it takes carbon from the environment and locks it up in these, in these mountain blanket bogs. There's two types of bogs. There's Atlantic bog and mountain blanket bog. The Atlantic bog you tend to find in sort of Connemara and around along the coastline on the west coast of Ireland. And the mountain blanket bog you find in the uplands in this zone. On, on the flatter areas, it'll occupy the flatter areas. Um, and these blanket bogs um, are 90% water. So they hold a huge amount of water. And so they're important as um, water holding areas to slowly release the water and avoid flooding downstream in times of, of high rainfall. Uh, and so uh, it's quite important that we restore our bogs or, or uh, maintain our bogs um, so that there's, there's less flooding downstream. And Ireland has 8% of all the world's bogs. So it's, it's a huge percentage. It's a very important resource um, for the country and should be protected. And I know there's efforts to restore um, bogs and um, and reinstate them in the way they once were because they're very important carbon sinks and they hold a very diverse range of uh, and rare range of plants and invertebrates even though they don't look like a lot and when we're just trying to cross them as hikers we're cursing and moaning because it's a we have to detour around and get our feet wet and one thing and another but you should really love your bogs people love your bogs they're a very important part of your heritage. Um, and where they're drained, of course, where bogs have been drained, um, then they, instead of becoming carbon sinks, they, they then become net emitters of carbon. And the, um, the government is moved to close the peat fired power stations in the Midlands, not, not just because of the, 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 the the carbon being emitted from the burning of the peat, but because the strip harvesting that they were doing was emitting huge amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So hopefully then those, I think that's their plan is to re-employ some of the staff from these power stations, from the people that were cutting the bogs before for the power stations to get these guys to start to work on reinstating these bogs and reflooding them and bringing them back into, into good nick. And that'd be a great resource for the country. But what can we find in blanket bogs? Well, cotton grass, you'll all be familiar with cotton grass, I'm sure. Um, the one on the left is the common cotton grass and it's multi-headed. So you've got one flower head there or seed head, because these are seeds, I should say, don't get it wrong. These are seeds. And then you've got several other heads of seeds here hanging down from the main one. So you've got multiple heads on the common 
cotton grass. And the one on the right is the hare's tail cotton grass. It's one single large head. And clearly it's, it's hare's tail looks like the bob on a hare's tail, doesn't it? So that's where it gets its name from. And cotton grasses are um, much more common in these sort of, in these damp areas, in these, these bogs. Another beautiful little plant of the bogs is bog rosemary. And this, um, it's quite rare, but it's locally common. So overall throughout the country, it's quite rare, but where it is found, where the conditions are ideal, then it's quite commonly found in that place. Um, and it's called bog rosemary, but it's actually a member of the heath family. So it's more closely related to the heathers we looked at earlier on. And it has these little pale pink bell-like flowers and these leaves, glossy, narrow leaves about centimetre, centimetre and a half long that look a bit like rosemary leaves. <clears throat> and this picture was taken in the Liffey Head Bog, which is the only active bog left in the east of Ireland, the only, the only growing bog, all the, all the rest have been drained. Um, and it's a great spot to go, Liffey Head Bog. So you can really have great fun exploring on there. And it's sitting here in a lot of sphagnum moss. And you can see the water, how damp the ground is. A few leaves of bog asphodel sticking up through there as well, um, through the bog rosemary there. And this is the sphagnum moss. And it's the sphagnum moss that makes the bogs. And it's the sphagnum moss that is the main constituent of the turf that is harvested. And each of these florets you see here is an individual plant. <clears throat> so a plant is just a long, skinny, thin, single stem with these like little starbursts coming off the side of it. And so each one of these little florets or starbursts is a single plant. And Within a square meter of bog, there can be many thousands of individual plants of sphagnum moss. And these sphagnum mosses are amazing. Uh, there, there are about, I think, 380, about 380 species of sphagnum moss. So there's, they're all very diverse and very different. And they can be pink, yellow, orange, or copper, or green red, all different types. And this one I think is called lustrous, lustrous sphagnum moss, I think is the name of this particular one. And the sphagnum mosses contain, uh, can contain up to 20 times their own weight in water. So they're great at holding water and storing water. And within their hollow stems and within their structure, they have thousands of individual microorganisms, tiny little beasties, diatoms, algae, flagellates, nematodes, tiny little beasties, grazers and hunters. It's a whole little world inside these plants. And this is the basis of the food chain in the bogs these wee little beasties that live inside the sphagnum moss. So when we drain the bogs and we destroy the mosses, then we destroy the roots of the food chain. So everything else is gonna die off as well. All that invertebrates, the wee insects, the mosquitoes, the, the, um, the larvae of, 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 um, of, other, of other little moth, moths and other insects that, that live on these, live on these, um, these other wee, creatures they um they're lost and so then the birds that live on those are lost and so the whole food chain collapses so these are as beautiful as they are in their own right they're, they are also the basis of this whole ecosystem of the bog <clears throat> there's, there's a few questions there specific to the bog um is the bog asphodel harmful to sheep or is this a myth is it what, sorry? Harmful to sheep. Harmful to sheep. Or is that a myth? 
I don't know if it is harmful for sheep. But what I should have said when we when we saw, looked at the bog hospital that its its other name is bone breaker, um, because um, the farmers. Oh, look at this thing going off on itself. Sorry, guys, it's very temperamental. Um, his Latin name is Ossifragum, which means bone breaker. And it was believed by the ancient farmers that the cattle that ate the uh, bog asphodel would, um, would, would suffer with broken bones. Um, but the real reason why the cattle suffered with broken bones was because the, uh, the environment in which the bog asphodel grows is very acidic. There's very little calcium. Um, and therefore, um, therefore, the cattle were, were getting um, calcium deficiency and their bones weren't growing properly. And therefore, if they took a slip or a tumble, then their bones were more likely to break. Um, and that was the real reason why, um, why they were getting broken bones and not because they were eating the bog asphodel. But whether that also applies to sheep or not, to get back to the question, I'm not sure. But it might do. It might do. I've not heard it being poisonous to sheep. But it's, it's rarely grazed by sheep. Sheep don't eat it. Deer kind of do a little bit, but I've not, I've not seen it really grazed by sheep. Okay, so we'll also find um, trees growing in ledges. This is a, a, a rowan tree. I'm sure you recognize that as a rowan with the red berries. That's when they're most obvious. Um, lots of food for birds in the hills. Uh, um, and these now on the hills are fairly less com fairly, you know, the less common because of the overgrazing. Sadly, the hills are heavily grazed um, either by excessive numbers of deer, um, but also by sheep. So, um, yeah, if we want to restore the mountains to something of their former glory, then we need to really take a hard look at sheep grazing on the hills and maybe reduce the numbers. But that obviously is a a discussion for another day. Okay, so we're moving up the zones. <clears throat> we're getting into what's called the montane zone. But the montane zone, I guess, would be typified by what you'd call kind of some of the mountain tops, some of the some of the mountains we might be familiar with in the Wicklow Mountains, like Camaderi or Tonlegi. Um, certain parts of the Reeks, maybe certain parts of the the um, Knockmill Downs or uh, the Golty Mountains, depending on where you are in the country, that kind of environment. Um, but the Montane Zone, again, would be lower in Donegal. So some of the, the, the hills of Donegal would definitely, blue stacks would definitely get into this, into this zone. And this normally would be uh, the boundary of a natural tree line because this is where climate starts to strongly influence the vegetation. And of course, as we're going up the zone, so the climate is changing, the weather is changing, it's getting wetter, it's get, they're getting less sunshine because they're more, there's more cloud in these zones. So, um, you know, it, the, higher, you know the, the, the higher mountains attract more cloud than the, the, the lower areas, so there's less sunlight. Um, the wind is often stronger, <clears throat> so you've got cold icy winds you know that, that will that will damage young growth so that the plants have to adapt to that as well so it's beginning to be get the environment's getting a little bit harsher now it's getting and, and the temperature's dropping so it's beginning to get a little bit less um, comfortable and a lot of the species you find in this zone are of high conservation value and are very susceptible to human activity, like trampling, for example. So when we go out hiking and we, 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 we uh, walk in these areas, then you know, we, we are um, in danger of doing damage to, the, to this environment. And <clears throat> so we need to consider that really when we're, when we're walking, uh, particularly where there's a lot of erosion damage in the hills. We need to think about whether we should be even though we're tempted to walk round the path and avoid the erosion, we're just we're, we're exacerbating the problem. So maybe we should stay to the muddy path where we can and avoid doing further damage. 
But in some parts of Ireland, this is the southernmost extent, this, this zone is the southernmost extent of certain Arctic alpine species. And these species are very vulnerable to global warming. For example, alpine club moss, which is a plant that is um, still growing in the Wicklow Mountains and in a few other places, but is, um, its range is becoming limited in Ireland. Um, it's not a rare plant globally, but it's becoming rarer in Ireland as, as temperatures go up. And as I said before, this zone again here is to provide by high precipitation, high winds, low temperature and low sunshine. So what you get then is more dwarf growing forms. Plants tend to be lower to the ground. So if you were, if you were uh, on the top of Lugnaquilla, for example, or up on or partway up Carantool or on top of um, top of Tunnel Gee or somewhere like that, then you are you, you'll notice that there isn't much lush foliage there. That all the what 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 foliage there is is fairly low to the ground and, and fairly looks like it's been clipped by the animals. Looks like it's been grazed, but that's a lot of that is 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 wind. It's been clipped by the wind. The wind is is, is, is um, preventing it from growing. So you get an increase in dwarf growth forms, which keep low in the very cold, windy conditions. So you won't see much heather or bilberry on these on those mountains we were mentioning. But you will find the change here is you'll find cowberry, crowberry, bearberry, alpine ladies mantle, club mosses, dwarf willows, sedges and mat grasses, all plants that are tough and can grow in these conditions. And you'll also find moss species that that um, are more adapted to, to growing in these conditions. So what does it look like this uh, this sort of this sort of montane? Well, here's a, a nice photo of the Man Turks over in Connemara. And you've got this sort of rocky ground, very thin soil, if any at all. Um, and little patches of vegetation, dotted low vegetation, you can see there. Um, barely hanging on in there, blasted by the blasted by the winds. This is around about, what is it, 600 meters in the Mam Turks here, something like that, 500 to 600 meters. And um, so our montane zone here maybe dropped down a little bit because we're in the west, gone a bit west and north. So maybe maybe it's a bit lower, the boundary. Um, these boundaries uh, are not hard and fast, of course, like everything else in nature. We're just trying to um, trying to define them a little bit, but it's that the, the boundaries move and the plants are not, you know, they're not listening to us. Um, they're doing their own thing. So they will find that there's a crossover across the boundaries. But, but in general, the pattern holds true. So you've got this very uh, sparse vegetation here with a lot of rock. <clears throat> and this is Am Alpine Lady's Mantle, um, <clears throat> quite a small plant hanging on in there, doing its best up in, the, up in, the, in that environment we were just in, up in the, in the Mam Turks. Um, and so uh, this is the sort of like alpine, this is a subalpine, Arctic alpine plant hanging on up in the, up in that montane zone. And um, there could be just maybe five centimeters across this whole plant. So they're not huge, they're close to the ground, hunkered down. So uh, look out for that when you're out and about in these sort of environments, because it's a nice wee plant. And you'll also see club mosses uh, as you get higher up into this zone. Club mosses come into their own. And this is fir club moss. It's the most common one we'll find in Ireland. And club mosses are a very ancient group of plants that go way back to uh, several, several hundreds of millions of years into the Carboniferous period um, when they were one of the dominant tree species on the planet. And back then they were forming forests of 30 meter high trees. Um, 
and uh, were the predominant one of the predominant tree species at the time. But they got out evolved, if you like. They got evolved. The, the, the vascular trees, as we know them, so the trees as we know them uh, evolved and outcompeted the club mosses. And so now they only survive as a few species, very small plants high up on the mountain where they can escape from the other. You know, remember we're above the tree line here now, we're on the boundary of the tree line. So these little chaps can survive. Um, so fir club moss is, is, is one of the more common ones. Um, and when it gets particularly chilly, we have this chap, this is alpine club moss. This is definitely an alpine species. Um, and this can be found in uh, as far south as Wicklow on Kipua Mountain. There's a column there's, that can be found up on the Kipua Mountain and a few other places around Ireland. Much more common in Scotland, of course, as you're going further north um, and the temperatures drop and, the, and it's colder, um, then it's hanging on there a bit better. Um, but this, this one is would be, with climate change, this plant is definitely under threat in Ireland. There's other club mosses, there's four or five species, uh, less common. There's another one called stag's horn club moss, which bifurcates as it spreads across the ground, a bit like the, the, the uh, antlers on a, on a, on a, on a deer, um, hence the name stag's horn club moss. Um, and I have seen that one growing up on um, um, Killer Key Mountain in the Dublin Mountains. So that's that's uh, round and about these parts. And this is deer grass. Deer grass is one of those plants. It does cross a lot of these boundaries. So you'll find it at all different levels. Um, and it's typified clump forming, very hard grass with these kind of little brown seed heads on the end of the little stalks, little rounded stalks. There may be a, like, there's a question, there may be a, a, a moss called a staghorn moss, but the staghorn club moss is not a moss. It's, um, I can't remember the Latin name, but um, it's, it, they're a separate group to themselves, the club mosses. Um, and don't mistake club moss for moss because they're not related to moss at all. It's just, in, it's just a common name. Right, so deer grass, you'll find this, yeah, I find it at all levels. And uh, we often, when we're walking through boggy patches of ground, we'll put our feet on the top of these clumps of deer grass because they're more resistant and don't give way quite so easily. So we often find ourselves walking on deer grass. To avoid the to avoid the wet patches, <clears throat> and deer grass will um, just go back there a sec. Deer grass turns this rather nice orangey brown in the autumn, so it's quite pretty in in in, in large swathes of it across the hillside. It does give a nice orangey tint to the hills in the autumn. The other thing we'll find is mat grass. Um, so whatever there's a kind of little grassy patch you come across. This is rather a large bit, but um, thank you very much for that. Someone's just told me the, the correct Latin name, Lycopodice, thank you. Um, then you've got, you, where you've got patches of, of, of grass higher in the mountains, almost invariably grazed by sheep and, and deer. You find these little grassy patches, um, then, there's almost certainly going to be this mat grass, as it's called, so-called mat grass. So then we're also going to find things up here like cowberry. So cowberry is distinctive. I've very rarely seen cowberry fruiting, but quite often see these very glossy green, <clears throat> small round leaves growing down very close to the ground. So we're talking really close to the ground here, one or two centimetres high that's all this is they don't grow big like bilberry very very close to the ground because of the environment in which they're growing <clears throat> and you'll also find crowberry down at this level as well and at this in this zone so this is crowberry
less common but definitely there in this in this in this environment is dwarf willow so this is a member of the willow family so it's actually a tree um and it's uh, it's ground hugging so it'll it's very close to the ground um to avoid the wind uh, uh, avoid desiccation from the wind uh, You might find dwarf willow in this zone as well. Um, you might al also find a juniper in that zone, a low growing juniper. I've mostly I've seen junipers over in Connemara. Have I seen, have I seen juniper? No, I don't think I've seen any junipers in the Wicklow Mountains, but mainly in Connemara. So you'll find low growing junipers as well. Then we get into the high montane zone. This is a sort of above 800 meters. Now, there wouldn't be very much of this sort of environment in Ireland. Um, the very highest mountains may be top of Karen Tall, even the top of Lugna Quilla doesn't really qualify, it's not high enough. Um, so it's not really found that much in Ireland. Um, be more likely to find it in Scotland, particularly in the Cairngorms. And it's similar to sort of equivalent to the global mid alpine zone. There's different gradings for, for the gl global gradings and the mid alpine zone continent in global scale similar to what we find on Greenland. <clears throat> and these are, this zone is typified by snow lying very late into the year. So you've got snow, snow fields quite late into the year. It's very sensitive to environmental changes and global warming for obvious reasons. And in this environment, you will find dwarf azaleas, brachymetrium mosses, mat grass, sedges, high altitude mosses, liverworts, and lichens. And what will it look like? Well, a bit like this. This is the Cairngorms. Not now, there's about six meters of snow in the Cairngorms, isn't that ridiculous? But anyway, huge amounts of snow up in Scotland at the moment in this area. But this sort of look in the foreground here, you've got this very rocky terrain, gravelly rocky terrain, very little, if any, vegetation. So it's a very difficult environment for plants to grow on. And you'll find there, bizarrely, this beautiful little plant, which is an azalea. This is the trailing azalea. And it grows in the Cairngorm Mountains at sort of over a thousand meters altitude. And it grows quite happily there. Where you, where you can find it, it covers huge areas of the ground. So it's very happy in that part of the world. And I've not seen this in Ireland. I don't think we'd find this, this fellow in Ireland, to be honest. But this we will find, woolly fringe moss. This is also a uh, moss that um, we find in high altitude. And we're very similar species to this we find in Ireland, higher up on, on rocks, um, in ro little hollows in the rocks where it can get a little foothold. Um, But they're all Rachymetrium species, but uh, some of them are more adapted to a very high altitude than others. And this one is, is a high altitude specialist. So you'll find that at high altitude. And it's, and it's woolly, like it's protection, isn't it? So it's all kind of like woolly and, 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 and it's almost like uh, insulation. It's insulating itself. And we'll find lichens up here as well. Now we'll find lichens low down as well, obviously. We all know that, we've all seen these lichens, but when you get up into this sort of zone with that sort of amount of bare rock, what, what, what looks like bare rock, then obviously there's much more lichen because there's more surface area for the lichens to grow on. So down in the lower zones, lichens tend to be on trees or on the odd boulder that's lying, that, that's, that's sticking up out of the vegetation. But up here in the high montane zone, then lichens come into their own because there's um, there's little competition for them. And there are many, many species of lichens, and lichens are a fascinating group of, of, of plants in that. Well, not really plants, they're beasts themselves, but they're um, they're they're a combination of an algae and a fungus in a sort of symbiotic relationship. 
sometimes with a, with a bacteria, a cyanobacteria as well. And in the relationship, the algae, in this symbiotic relationship, the algae photosynthesizes and so produces energy and food, sugars, and the, the fungi provide structure and shelter from the desiccating winds so the algae don't dry out. So they kind of work together and um, different algae and different fungi combine with each other and produce a very diverse range of lichens. And they cover, I can't remember the exact percentage, but it's like about 7% of the land surface of the earth is, is lichen. It's a, an amazing percentage. And that's because they generally cover all the upland, all the rocky mountains uh, are covered in lichen. Um, and though the individual species are quite difficult to identify, we can break them down into three, three main groups. And in this, this gray green cauliflower looking one, the bottom left part of the screen, that's what we call a crustose lichen because it's like forms a crust on the surface. So that's where we get the name from, crustose lichen. And then the sort of silver gray one in the top right hand part of the screen with a sort of flaky looking structure, looks a bit like foliage. And that's indeed, that's a foliose lichen. So you've got crustose and foliose lichens. Uh, and they, they often grow in with, you know, side by side. And then you've got ones I'm sure you're more familiar with, um, like these uh, devil's matchsticks, the red tips, I'm sure you've all seen these, or the pixie cups is another one, pixie cup lichens, there's a little pixie cup lichen in the top corner of this one, or the, uh, or the sort of the old man's beard type of lichens, those ones, the, the reindeer moss, those, all that kind of lichen, those ones um, are what we call fruticose, fruticose lichens, because they have fruiting bodies, or well, they all have fruiting bodies, but these have more obvious fruiting bodies that we can see very clearly in this case, bright red. Um, so the three main types of lichens there worth um, just trying to get a handle on those three names. Very useful if you're doing any qualifications, mountain qualifications, folks, because when there's not much else to talk about, you can always talk about lichens. Okay, and the last thing we find at this up here is what we call stiff sedge. So this is a mountain sedge. Um, very tough plant hanging on in there. It's all brown, isn't it? It's looking, <clears throat> looking a bit weather beaten, this one. But again, you might find this kind of plant at these very high altitudes. Here we go. So we can break down, we can break down the, um, just to go over it again, we can break down the, the, the zones, uh, the areas in which we find particular plants into these zones, and they fit quite well. The, 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 the lowland zone, the sub-montane, the montane, and the high montane, and see how different assemblages, how different, um, different assemblages of plants and different um, ecological niches, if you like, develop within each of those zones. And they are, do have their own niches. There would be other plants, there'd be other, uh, sorry, insects, invertebrates, birds, um, that, will, that will, frogs, um, lizards that live <clears throat> within these zones. Um, uh, and so there's this, they're, they're a little ecosystem to themselves, but they do overlap a fair bit, I have to say. Cool, that's it folks, there you go. Thanks, Russ. There's a, a good few questions um, if you have a bit of time, Derek. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'll just get a quick sip of water and then we'll go for yeah. it. We'll just stay <laughs> on the lichens for a moment. Um, someone mm. wants to know, is, a stag, is staghorn a lichen, even though it's called a moss? No, um, the club mosses are not mosses at all, and they're not lichens either. Though they may, they're, um, it's just a common name but they are very different plants. <clears throat> Fair enough. Uh, do you think that it is likely that all species of Irish upland flora have now been discovered, or do you think that it is likely that there are still new species to be discovered? Okay, well, yeah. only last year, they discovered a new moss 
was it a fern? I better get that right. I can't remember. Anyway, a new a new plant was discovered down in County Kerry. So a new a new plant known to science only last year was discovered. So so you know, there's more and more people are searching for these things. Um, so it becomes increasingly less likely as time goes on, but it's never impossible because it's only happened last year. Good. Uh, yes, Martin, it's been recorded, so you don't need to remember everything. Um, uh, you will be I able to go back over it. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a few questions here. Yeah, is crowberry edible? Yes, you can eat it, but it's horrible. I have tried it. I tried it once. For, I tried it once for, for scientific research. It was vile, very, very bitter. Yeah, so I wouldn't so, recommend it. Yeah, someone else asked, can you recommend any uh, medicinal or edible plants we might see on hill? Well, certainly the bilberry. Definitely, that's the one that you can definitely eat. So the frochen, the bilberry, you can definitely eat those. So I'd recommend that. Very good eating. Oh. Yeah, someone asked, could you buy, can you buy bilberry plants in Ireland? Can you buy them? Yeah. I would think probably uh, if you try to buy them in a garden centre, it's likely to be a cultivated variety like a blueberry because they give a larger and sweeter fruit. Um, they, they wouldn't do well in your back garden because they like, you know, it's, 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 they're, a, they're a mountain plant. So if you lived on a mountainside, then, you know, you'd be okay, but they, 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 they wouldn't translate very well to the back garden really. Uh, is sphagnum in any way dangerous to humans? No, absolutely not. They used to use sphagnum moss in the first world war as a, um, a dressing for wounds because of the acidity of the water in which, in which because sphagnum has this really useful property in that it, um, it, it makes the water around it acid, which is why bogs are acid. They're not acid by mistake. They're acid because the sphagnum moss makes them acid. And by making the, the, the water acid, its surroundings acid, then it, it, it um, restricts the growth of other species. So it's actually, it's, it's, a, it's an aggressive, um, tactic that the plant uses to, to dominate that environment. Um, and that acid, yeah, the, that acid acts as an antiseptic because it kills bacteria and stuff like that. So it's, that was why they were, it was used as a dressing in the First World War. So no, it's not harmful. I don't know if you can eat it. I wouldn't want to eat it, but anyway, yeah. no. Um, yeah, just going back earlier in the presentation, uh, did you say Ireland has 80% or 8% of world's blanket bog? Eight. Eight, yeah. Eight. Of course, you can also find, if you're lucky, which we didn't have, we didn't put up in the bog there, but you can also find cranberries. But I've only found cranberry in Ireland on one or two occasions. It's, it's not that easy to find. But, you know, the wild cranberry, again, that's, that you can eat that, obviously. Cranberry sauce at Christmas is a is a popular thing and yeah you can find that in the hills if you're lucky uh, there's another one in west cork a little blue flower up to sub montane not a milkwort could it be a form of gentine gentian gentian a wee blue flower now um where was it what what, what area west cork west cork up um, to sub montane um it might be yeah i mean of course you've got you've got alpine gentians you find an awful lot of those in the barren and they're like trumpet like trumpet like flowers around about sort of five centimeters long um and they're um they're very common there in the barren um i suppose Yeah, I'm looking at some of the comments coming up here. That's why I paused there. Yeah, and some people are saying it could be the flowers of the butterwort that that person's referring to. And they're absolutely right. It could well be the flowers of the butterwort that you're seeing there. Yeah. A very specific question. Is bilberry fruit dangerous for some diabetics to eat? I have no idea. Yeah. 
Why would it be dangerous for diabetics? That's an interesting one. I'm not sure about that one. Yeah. I can't imagine why it should be. I mean, there's very little sugar in it. It's quite a tart fruit. So does that make a difference? I don't know if there's anything specific there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are there any programs in the works to encourage conservation farming in the uplands, do you know? Yeah, I mean, there is. Um, and obviously with the Green Party in, with, with, with some hold on the reins of power, small one perhaps, that uh, there are sort of moves afoot, I think, to, um, to increase the sort of biodiversity and, and the sustainability of farming in Ireland. But there's, there's sort of, it's all being pulled in different directions. You know, the government until very recently were, was encouraging farmers to increase the number of animals that they owned, that, that they had on a specific piece of ground. And that was put a lot more pressure on, on the land, you know. Um, but the, the, the government is under a lot of financial pressure from the EU because it pays millions of euros, hundreds of millions of euros of your tax, tax monies um, to the EU every year in fines because it fails to meet its carbon footprint targets. And so that is why the government is quite keen to, to uh, reduce its carbon footprint and why we're getting lots of wind farms popping up and why we're, um, why we're seeing the, 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 um, the, the peak power stations uh, being closed. But also the government are doing good stuff. They, you may be aware that around the Dublin mountains, they're now changing, uh, they're now, the areas around the Dublin mountains are now being failed uh, and they're gonna be replanted with native species to improve the sort of wildlife value and the recreational value of, of, the, uh, of, of the area. So there, is, there are positive things that the government's doing. And, and as far as I'm aware, the bogs that, they're, um, that they will not be harvesting from in the Midlands in the future for the power stations, that they want to reinstate those bogs and employ the employ the ex-employees to to work on reinstating those bogs so um whether that comes to fruition in the you know when the government looks at the the huge debt it's going to end up with mm -hmm. as a result of the covid pandemic with another thing we shall see <clears throat> yeah there's a there's a lot of comments a bit of banter as well on the bogs but um just a lot of appreciation for highlighting the importance of bogs as well um, yeah i think i mean you know there were talk that there should be a unesco heritage site you know <laughs> really should they are such an important resource for the country and such an important you know natural environment on a worldwide scale that we should be really taking a lot of care of them they're part of your heritage they're as much a part of your heritage as your as traditional music and your language very much in my opinion yeah. as, as being a non a non-irish person you might not thank me for saying that but i do i think i think you know irish irish bogs are astonishing yeah um and then on the on the yeah. other side of that then uh someone was asking about what your views are are on invasive species in Ireland, such as like the Japanese knotweed or the hogweed, etc. Yeah, and one of the one of the threats to the boglands, uh, particularly in the southwest and the hills in the southwest, is um, is invasive species like Rhododendron ponticum, which um, some of you will be familiar with, I'm sure, and it's a big problem uh, to control for sure. Um, and there are invasive species uh, and and the national parks would like to do something about it, I'm sure. Um, one of the sort of less um, impressive statistics, if you like, around this government is that the government gives more money to the, to the greyhound racing industry than all the national parks combined. So that's something to be thinking about, isn't it, really? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but if the national parks had more resources, they could deal with the invasive species. That's basically, you know. 
Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> um, still a few here. Um, yeah, Russ, what are your thoughts on uh, deforestation in Ireland and how it will affect plants? Deforestation? <laughs> deforestation. Oh, crumbs. Um, yeah, talk around. I could do another session on, on, on for, forest cover. Yeah. Um, Ireland has very little of its um, original forest remaining very, very little of its native forest, and small patches, woefully, woefully small patches, little bits. There's a bit bits around Glendalock that are very ancient because uh, the monks used to own it at Glendalock. Yeah. And uh, they didn't let it get cut down, but you know, most of it's gone. And what they're replacing it with in large part is Sitka spruce species. And the reason why they were replacing it in large part with Sitka spruce is because it's fast growing and it grows on really rubbish wet ground. And so it sequesters a lot of carbon. So it's a quick fix, another quick fix for this, uh, for this terrible carbon footprint we have in this country. Um, but ideally we should be planting native species like oak and birch and rowan and things like that. And they are in places, they are in places, but it's a balancing act all the time. Um, and certainly in some giving grants to farmers just to plant Sitka spruce, um, just so and, and covering large acreages of marginal land in Sitka spruce, I think is 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 a short-sighted um, policy. Um, because you're not going to increase the biodiversity that way. Um, and you know, Ireland's biodiversity is wouldn't go as far as to say it's a basket case, but it's it's not great, you know. You know, farming um, farming practices, and not just in Ireland, but you know, it's not just an Irish problem. But um, you know, farming practices are not great for biodiversity, and it's not often the fault of the farmer. It's the way that they are that the the grants are paid to them from the from the agricultural policy, um, and um, perhaps if th those were looked at and changed so that farmers were rewarded for conservation rather than rewarded for productivity, then maybe we would increase our diversity, our biodiversity. But, you know, our attitudes are slow to change, but maybe they will. Maybe in time it will change. I know there's younger farmers coming through who have a much more, um, much more eco-friendly approach to their farming, for sure. <clears throat> Uh, just you mentioned oak trees there. Rona mentioned earlier wasp galls that are that apparently usually grow on oak trees, but uh, she saw it on a birch tree. Is that unusual? Well, they won't be the same. They won't be the same gall wasp because um, oak gall wasp won't be able to do what do its thing on a different species. Um, I've not seen galls on birch trees ever. Um, I've seen other things on them, but never galls. Yeah. So that's an interesting one. Yeah, I'd have to I'd have to investigate that and see if there's such a thing as a birch tree gall. But I've never I've never seen one myself. She sent me a picture. I think so. I'll send it on to you if you want to have. Oh a look. yeah, do that. That'd be good. Yeah, yeah. always learning. Yeah. I'm not saying um, they don't exist. I'm just saying I don't know of them. Yeah, there's a few people um, just looking for recommendations. I think one was earlier when you were talking about. Um, I think it was specific material on where you're talking about uh, ferns that attach themselves to polypodies yeah 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 um, and then just in general people were requesting any good books um, oh yeah I've got, there's a very very good book which can people see me yep you're pinned yeah can you read that folks britain's ferns yeah that's the by. Can you read that? James yeah. Merriweather. Yeah. Britain's Firms by James Merriweather. That what well, that's came out last year. Highly recommend that book. So that one, it covers everything. It covers ferns, it also covers the club mosses, the horse tails, um, as well. So yeah. And that, this is that's a good book. Yeah. That's the one I would recommend. The price. 
Uh, printed in Italy. Thanks so many, but it does come from the UK. So it might, <laughs> there may be a, a couple of months before you get it. Um, there was one question there. Where did you find the um, the wild cranberries? In our Where did I see the cranberries? Uh, no, that's a good question. Um, trying to think now where I saw them. It might have been the Liffey Head Bog, um, which is near Kipur, if you don't know where the Liffey Head Bog is. It's near Kipur, up on the other side of the road from Kipur. That's where the lug rises, the Liffey Head is, the, is where the lug, the Dargle, and the Avonmore all, um, all start. So they all start in that one area. Mm -hmm. Might have been there, or it might have been. Might have, yeah, I'm trying to think where else I might have been that I'd seen it, but um, might be there. Uh, there was another question: hair ice. Um, she had not noticed it uh, before this year. There's lots of it bursting out of rotten trees, tree branches. Hair ice. Hair ice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a meteorological phenomenon. Right. Yeah. Um, it's bursting out of rotten tree branches on otherwise non-icy ground. And otherwise non icy ground. Yeah. But, but it was it sub zero temperatures when it was doing it. But it's not, then it's obviously not ice. But yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> That's a question for um, Met Aaron, that one. Yeah. <laughs> you want to Twitter Barra Best? Go on Twitter, and, and Barra Best is always on Twitter. Go and ask him, you'll know. All right. For yeah, sure. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, there's just a few comments there. There's lots of questions. Um, is it not true that Quilter are now changing their policy to plant more native trees? Yeah, I think you did. Yeah, that's the one that's on the yeah. mountains. Yeah. 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 It's a it's a branch, it's a separate branch of Quilter called Quilter Nature. And they're um they're responsible for, for this policy, they're for carrying it out. This government policy, it's a non-for-profit arm of Quilture, but Quilture itself is still very much into, you know, making profit from timber. So, yeah, it's not a whole, not changing the whole of the organisation. They're just setting up a separate, separate branch of it. Uh, just this one question here. Um, I hope I pronounce this right now. Rhododen. Rhododendron is rampant in the Knockmill Downs and increasingly becoming more prevalent in the southern slopes of the Galtees. What yeah. can clubs do to lobby for its removal to protect our mountain habitat? Okay, yeah, that's Rhododendron ponticum. That's the common rhodo. And it's a garden escapee. It used to be, a, it came and was planted, as a lot of these invasive plant species are, planted in gardens and then escaped. Um, and it is a big problem. And if there was an easy solution to removing rhododendron ponticum, then I'm sure people would have done it. And I've seen it in the knock mill downs and it's really bad there. Um, and, it, and I'm not surprised to, say, to hear that it's in the Southern Galtees as well. <clears throat> the only thing you can do is pull it up when it's small. That's what you've got to do. So, you know, we think when we're being destructive, if we pull up plants on the mountains, but you can make the exception with rhodos. And if you see small ones, then pull them up and just leave them on the ground. And if, if you're doing your club walk and you're just walking down the hillside and you see rhodos, then do that. And that will stop them getting to big ones and stop the spread of the rhodo further up the hillside. But once they're big, there's little that you can do. Um, I think one, the, one of the control methods they have is just cutting them down they cut them down and then but they'll grow back once you cut them down they'll grow back but you just yeah. have to keep repeating the process but they are very difficult to control without pulling out the roots yeah that's good advice um someone just mentioned there in terms of bog conservation uh to look up irish peatland conservation council the ipcc yeah they're very good a lot of information there yeah and um, body. yeah do a great job Someone else just mentioned the proposed new agri-environmental scheme is now open for comments as well. Yeah. So listen, I think you've answered a lot of questions tonight. I think we'll leave it there for now. Um, just Very a good. huge thank you, Russ, for you, all buddy. your knowledge.
Um, I hope the folks found it useful. Fascinating insight to the flora life of the uplands. Um, and there's a lot of thank yous running along on the chat as well. Um, but just, uh, just thank you so much for, for this evening. And thanks everyone for attending as well. Um, yeah. As you can Excellent. see up on the screen there, there is last week's our last week of this series. So there's a few things left to see. Um, so hopefully we'll see a few of you there next week. But again, can't thank you enough for us. Uh, it's been a really interesting night. Um, thanks for spending the time uh, to impart all your fantastic knowledge. On oh, that's great. It's been a pleasure. I have a little bit of knowledge, but not a huge amount. I'll pass on what I can. Oh, I, I think you're being modest there now, Russ. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate it. Take yeah, care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming along.